And I would like to ask, because we see the GP more frequently than we see our respirologist, and neither one of them deal with our liver. And most of us, or I should speak for myself, I have a lung issues, but I also worry about my liver. And uh, is there a level that maybe you should have your liver tested or that blood test, say, every three months? And uh, whoever wants to take that, I enjoyed all of you, so I don't care. Whoever wants to take a stab at that. You're out of my age group. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good answer. Oh, you, you beat me to it, Peter. I mean, I, I think I have a first stab at, a stab at that. I mean, um, you know, if we know that the adults with uh, lung disease and alpha-1 and trypsin uh, can have liver issues as well, but usually not as severe as, as those who have liver issues as the initial presentation in childhood or in, in their adolescent or early years in their life. Um, I think there's good value in terms of screening at least every six months to a year to look at your liver. And the, the test is actually very easy. It's just a simple blood test that we draw and you can look at your liver enzymes uh, where you can see if there's any ongoing or persistent damage or if any damage at all. And if there's damage, there's actually uh, blood markers that you could use to look at the functional ca capability of the livers at that time. I mean, by far and large, I think though most people adults anyway, I'm, I'm speaking a little bit of my age group here, uh, uh, with uh, in the old, sort of in the later years of their life, tend to have more lung problems than liver problems. But uh, yes, I think it's uh, at least annual screening would not be unreasonable. Yeah. Yeah, that is the, uh, that's the um, uh, recommendation of um, uh, the latest article came out September last year. Uh, Dr. Chapman's name is on it. I, I think he's the underlying troublemaker, but the first uh, author is uh, somebody called Bode. Um, uh, and um, in the Canadian Medical Association Journal, and their, their recommendation is that if you, uh, if you get your liver function test, it's a simple blood test, as Jap says, um, that if there's any abnormality, uh, then that's different. But uh, as adults, um, people who get lung disease often don't have any liver problem, but it's worth monitoring. If there's anything wrong, then you should have uh, ultrasound of the liver, again, non-invasive. Um, but the blood work once a year, I mean, if you come to me for your annual physical, uh, we don't have an annual physical anymore. We have a periodic health exam uh, <laughs> <laughs> once a year. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, annually, yeah. At, at which, you know, I, I be, might be measuring your cholesterol and your, your sugar, see if you're developing diabetes at middle age, 40, but whatever. So um, at the same time, if, you, if I knew you had alpha-1, I'd just add the liver function test, take a stroke of a pen, uh, while the, the, most of these biochemical tests are processed in the lab and uh, by a machine. So it doesn't take any more work to do it and it's nice to know that your liver function is fine. Uh, and if, if that's all right, then the fact that you're fatigued is probably because your lungs are damaged. Yeah, yeah that, that article actually, the third author, Dr. Simon Ling, who's a pediatric hepatologist, he's, it's um, Ontario's version of Dr. Yap. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that, that's, been the recommendation as well. And I, there was also another recent study, and again, it was a small study, but they looked at um, ZZs who, uh, I think it was in Europe, one country in Europe, ZZ people who had, uh, um, who had, were lung affected and then subsequently developed uh, liver problems, and it was, it was around 50%. Um, now, it's only one study, it was a small study, and you know, it needs to be replicated, but um, so kind of supports that too. Any other questions? The question was, can this lady have her glass of red wine every day? Um, I don't think doc Dr. Yap recommends it to his patients. <laughs> <laughs> but just, I would recommend just to the mothers, usually. Yeah. <laughs> I would recommend it taking myself, though. <laughs> 
Uh, no, I mean, like, if it's a glass of red wine a day, it's actually okay. You know, there is alcohol limits that you we do set. You know, a glass of red wine doesn't exceed that at all. So if you enjoy a glass of red wine a day, that's fine. I didn't know I was dead dead when I had my children. All four of them were jaundiced, like every one of them, and badly. They were all under phototherapy. Yeah. Would that have anything to do with it? Have they uh, had their uh, genotype done since, or, or phenotype? Are they MZs, all of them, or SZs? Or? You know, I'm kind of assuming that they're MZs. My husband is an M, I'm a Z. Yeah, so they'd all be MZs. If you're ZZ and he's right. MM, they're MZ. all MZs, yeah. So would that? Yeah, that have been part just of it? concurs, uh, goes along with what we, we, we saw, but unfortunately I didn't report it, so I'm sorry. <laughs> so but I'll pitch in on that qu question a little. Um, we're kind of in an age where we're actually talking about genetic modifiers, you know, and uh, for example, cystic fibrosis is a good example. Uh, you could have siblings in the family that have uh, cystic fibrosis, they carry the same genetics, uh, they live in the same family, they eat the same thing, they do the same thing as their other sibling does. But yet their li the cause of their liver disease is very different. Right? And the reason behind is that there are minor changes in our genetic makeup that can actually predispose one to greater severity of liver disease compared to the other. Right? And in, in CF anyway, we know that alpha-1 antitrypsin being an MZ actually mod can modify the cause of your liver disease in cystic fibrosis. Now, for prolonged neonatal jaundice, which you've described in your four children, there are things that could modify the duration of jaundice. It doesn't mean necessarily mean they have cystic fibrosis or they have uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin, but an example is that if you are a, if the child is a carrier for something called Gilbert syndrome, we know that uh, Gilbert is completely benign, okay? But we know that if you have Gilbert's and you are breastfed totally as an infant, the chances of you have the infant actually having prolonged jaundice is actually greater than someone who doesn't have Gilbert's syndrome, okay? So it's a genetic modification of a certain protein that puts you at a slightly greater risk than, than somebody else that doesn't have, and that's about it. Yeah, I think we didn't think it was the cause. It was just an interesting observation that those patients just randomly selected all were MZs. Okay, well, we'll figure that out. I've got a question that, that, that somebody emailed, maybe I could ask, and they were concerned about um, needing statins and the effect that might have on, on their liver, a patient who is ZZ. So, uh, I mean, statin, a minority of patients with statin can have uh, abnormal liver tests uh, as secondary to the medication itself. So, oh, uh, separate and apart from the. Separate, alpha. completely separate. I mean, like, even a healthy, otherwise not in the, uh, individual with no other re reasons to have liver disease, when they start statin, there is a small probability that statin may cause a, a liver dysfunction. Uh, so, in this context, a checking before and after starting, starting medication might not be unreasonable. Right. Uh, yeah. In, in my, the adult practice, if I start someone uh, on a statin for their raised cholesterol, um, we, we, the practice is to take, uh, do the liver function tests before you start the medication, and then again at three months, and then at their annual, because um, it, you, their liver function tests, the levels rise, um, but as far as we know, to no bad effect. But the, the advice that comes with uh, the medication is that if it goes to three times the normal, so if it, the top of normal is 40 and you get above 120, then maybe you should stop the statin. But if it goes up to 60 or 70, it doesn't matter, just keep an eye on it. Um, uh, but it doesn't actually seem to have any damage to the liver. It's just slower processing. The uh, jaundiced and breastfed infant. Um, is there any long-term um, coincidence down the road when they are breastfed and jaundiced, and then down the road, is there any link to um, liver effect, um, being liver affected related to that jaundice? Oh, uh, the answer is no. I mean, it depends on uh, what's the cause of the jaundice. I guess you know if it's just a 
what we call physiological jaundice with breastfeeding, the answer is there's no long-term consequence from it. Yeah. Jaundice in newborns is because when the, the baby's in the womb, it has a higher hemoglobin level uh, than when after it's born because it's ex extracting oxygen from blood, not from air. And so the hemoglobin goes down from 17 to 14. And when they break down the, the, the blood, if it's an immature liver, so a preemie baby particularly, uh, it will go yellow because it can't get rid of the, the, blood, the blood product, the, the bile, fast enough. Uh, and it's worse if the baby's dry. Um, so often, a uh, baby who's a bit jaundiced at birth, if they get proper, if they get enough water to drink, even if they can't latch on properly, so it, it's often with a feeding problem, and it's more common with the breastfed babies, that, that that's the physiological jaundice. That's, if you like, healthy jaundice, normal. Um, but abnormal jaundice would be one that was prolonged. Yeah. Regarding the omega-3 intake, yeah. um, I was just wondering if you've come across any um, for our children that don't like fish, compared to as much ketchup as we try, um, is there a route that you're using with, um, besides infant formulas, with DHA, do you have any other supplements you recommend? Um, or, or do you know of any studies that are going on with um, supplements that have right. good um, safety? So uh, um, we don't routinely supplement otherwise healthy children. Uh, with DHA, EPA, or fish oils, because uh, it's difficult to actually justify the outcomes from it. Uh, we do know that our general diet, everybody actually across the board, adults and children, do have slightly lower levels than uh, of omega-3 that we, we think it's ideal. But even the, what we think is ideal is also very disputable between uh, individuals and also studies as well. Uh, if you the best way to obviously get some of these products into you is to, to eat food that contains uh, omega-3 fatty acids like fish and so forth. Um, but that's challenging if your child doesn't like it. And uh, we know what they can be like when they're two, three, four years of age. Um, the alternative would be to have a multivitamin that contains some omega-3 in it, that's all, uh, that you could use, you know. And the doses actually do vary, vary between uh, brands to brands. Um, and not, I don't think any of them actually come close to anywhere uh, what we think is ideal for the child. But again, as I said, nobody really knows what's ideal as well. So. Can NZ people have alpha-1 symptoms and deterioration? Um, MZ... Um, has a slightly increased risk of developing COPD. Um, latest um, article that I had on that was that 2% of people with MZ will develop COPD. However, 1.8% of the population will develop COPD or 10% of the population will actually have COPD. So whether this is a, 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 a sort of weakness towards that um, uh, as Peter said, there's, there's not an all or one um, uh, uh, interpretation. If you have ZZ, you're high risk. But if you have some enzyme, how low do you have to go before it's critical? And we believe at the moment that, the, that 11 uh, micromoles per liter is the level below which you're at risk. And the only uh, phenotype that goes that low is ZZ. SZ crosses the line between sort of 17 and 10, so it just touches on, on being a, at risk. MZs, they're usually lower than 20, but they're not below the, the line at 11. So um, yeah, I don't know with an individual patient, but for an actual risk, um, they're, they're above the line, so they're, they're, they're safe. I think the problem is with the uh, sort of uh, stigma of being labeled with uh, one of these genetic defects and people don't want to know, and the same thing that Dr. Cave said with this study, it's hard to get a group together that you can actually make those statements because you need huge amounts of people to follow, probably 10,000 or something like that before you get the real drift. And I think our issue in medicine right now is trying to figure out how much of these functional levels of 
product do you need? Like how much alpha-1 antitrypsin is just enough? And how come if you're just at 10%, you, you wouldn't go, if it was 90% off on a sale, you'd be there buying it. If it's 80% off, you probably would too. But when you're down to 50%, you might look at it twice. And I don't know, I think these patients will show, ha have something going on. Like some of these issues that we have with the MZs are showing up, but I, I don't think we have enough data to give you a clear answer to that. Because I certainly worry about it in our patients, because we have lots of those people around. And we have a, you know, as we, you know, we don't know who the ZZs are. God, we don't know who the MZs are. There, yeah. there are thousands in Edmonton, uh, and they're not presenting with any symptoms, so they're not getting tested. Yeah. So we'd need thousands of people yeah. with MZ and follow them for 20 years and see what happens. Yeah. yeah. That's the next project. <laughs> Back to the question of statins uh, in regard to the individual that emailed us. Um, her physician was using it on, in an off-label situation because of the anti-inflammatory properties. And so I wondered if you had any comment about that as an off-label use. I can even answer that because I'm old enough to have to take statins. They work in everybody. And I think we're going to find out, like even in the cystic fibrosis group, which I work a lot in, they're talking about using them. They're an interesting group of drugs. And again, it's going to take thousands of people to figure it out. But they change things markedly in your body. And I can see why that doctor would have thought about doing that. I have, uh, I am a ZZ. And I've got two daughters with alpha-1 and a son that is, one that hasn't been tested yet. His blood test came back as negative of having the alpha one, but he has a daughter that has it. Well, he must be a carrier if his daughter's ZZ. He must have one Z, which he contributed, and his wife contributed the other Z. Uh, for the daughter to have ZZ, he must have MZ or SZ or something. Um, yeah, the, the Mendel's P's business, you know, and, and if you have four kids, one of them will be ZZ and one of them will be MM. Uh, yeah, but, you know, that's the chances. If you have 40 kids, they'll balance out like that. Um, but if you have four, you might, they might all be Z, 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 and Z, Z. You know, you might be just unlucky. You know, do you do the lottery? Uh, you know, <laughs> um, your chances of getting four Z, Z would be remote. But getting two is not, not surprising. Yeah. My, uh, my question to that, when was the lab test done? And uh, where was it done? For yeah. the ZZ, um, my daughters to the U.S., my other daughters to the U.S. The doctors where we are, they refused to test for it. We literally had to force them to test him for it, and they flat out refused, threatened to go to a different doctor, and they're like, oh, fine, we'll test. And, but they were very upset with us, doesn't have it, and it took them five years to where, where where was she? Where was your daughter tested? Provost. Okay. Yeah, we have a lot of trouble getting tests done in this province. Everybody talks about it. It's just just go and you know I kind of like this idea. You can send it off to the states because you will get an answer and probably the right answer. In Alberta, uh, for me, and I would order this occasionally. What a dog and pony show! I got it just about give them a skin biopsy or a lung biopsy to prove that I need the test. Because they were, they were negating us. Your doctors probably tried to do it and they got refused by the lab. If I ask for a phenotype, even if the numbers aren't as low, because I have a really high suspicion, like on your, your daughter, you'd ask for a, ph a phenotype just to see uh, you know, if it's an MZ or something. They won't do it unless it's too low. And, you know, as Dr. Cave has said, they, they automatically test at certain levels. But if the kid was a bit ill or something at the time, her level might have been high enough because there's other reasons for it to jump up a little bit from time to time. So I do have worries about these tests and I'll often double test people if I'm not happy with what I'm getting. Yeah, just to follow up on that, the test is, um, the test take is a part of an acute phase reactant, duh. Um, um, one of those fancy names. But basically it's affected by if you just had a recent infection. Uh, it'll be up for a while afterwards. So she may have got into the normal levels for a while. 
uh, and that, you know, I, my, trying to defend the GP, he, he, as Peter said, he may well have just been turned down by the lab. They said, it isn't low enough for us to test, you know. But, yeah. but if they wait till they're in a stable state, they haven't had any recent infection, it might have been low. So, yeah. Yeah. so my question. changes or have there been changes so that I should go and get checked again? If you're a true ZZ and you were done at a, at a reasonable lab, you probably are. And I have no idea. I think I was about two years old. Yeah. So. Yeah. Where, where was it done? Were you in Alberta? Yeah, in Calgary. Yeah. Yeah. You're, prob you're probably close to right, yeah. If you're, if you're uh, like this lady, if you're above the line, uh, then it may, it may be you need retesting. But if you're below the line, uh, then you're probably below the line for sure. Yeah. I, I don't think it needs retesting, but um, um, uh, if you were getting symptomatic, if you'd never had a chest infection in your life, then I may be test it again because yeah. I, I would suspect you'd have shown up in 30 years something going on but yeah. I'm a practicing physician I never trust the lab <laughs> you you would like to have confirmation and you know I, the, you know the next question to you would be do you have any symptoms and the reason they did you was they must have thought of something yeah yeah so, you know, that would have been the smart thing to do back then is to check. And, uh, you know, mistakes happen in these labs. And uh, I'm not here to defend the labs. I'm not here to criticize them. But I think they're valuable to have. And, and you need that, that information. But you don't want the insurance companies to get it yet. My sister had, um, she was diagnosed around the same time I was, which was in 93. And in 94, 95, she developed like the alpha one very severely. So about uh, in 2005, she had a lung transplant. And um, I just wanted to know, is it because, and I haven't had any symptoms yet. So I want to know, is it because her levels were lower than mine or, or my levels were higher? She's quite a few symptoms, like she's, um, she had the lung transplant. She was doing good for a while, but now she's kind of, her other lung is giving out. She only had one lung done. So is that something that I have to look forward to, or is it because her levels were lower than mine? Yeah, the, the, the predictor of whether you're going to get uh, disease is not only genetic, okay? Uh, you can have ZZ and uh, avoid getting ill uh, by not smoking. Um, not, it shouldn't, must not go outside this room, but <laughs> only 10% of smokers will get COPD. <laughs> um, how many alpha ones will get lung disease? Uh, how many alpha uh, ZZs? Not all ZZs will get sick. Okay, uh, a large number of them, but there'll be some who don't. Sounds like you're one of those. However. Uh, I have uh, a set of twins in my practice, and at 12, one of them, the, one of the sisters, became uh, acute juvenile diabetic, needed insulin straight away, et cetera, et cetera. Ten years later, her twin sister did the same. But for those ten years, that, the, the second sister was not diabetic at all. We tested her up and down the yin yang, but she wasn't diabetic. Um, so. If you start getting symptoms, take it seriously, but you may be one of those who doesn't get symptoms. The, 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 Jeanette, we should have had oh, Diane. I, well, I, I can maybe speak a bit to that. Uh, twins aren't twins. Um, very few of you are exactly identical. That's the first thing. Like, you'll share common genes, but as you've heard from the panel here, if you have other genes that may be modifying how that other gene is going to affect you, and the other thing that I see in pediatrics is one kid will get absolutely slammed by an infection and the other kid doesn't get it. 
How come? And of course, in this disease, if your sister was exposed to some bad infection somewhere along the way and or an occupational hazard that she didn't even know, something she inhaled somewhere along the way, that's the difference. Uh, it's just how your body reacts to the insult to the lung. Um, I'm an SSED, and the only reason I found out I was an SSED was because I had numerous colds that weren't going away. And my friends started saying, you know, you're sick all the time. And I said, yeah, I know, whatever. And they said, no, you're sick all the time. So I went to my doctor and I said, I'm sick all the time. <laughs> but, I'm not, but I wasn't going in to see her because it was just a cold. So I said, I need you to test everything lung related because something's wrong. And she said, no, you're fine. I said, I want you to test for everything lung related because I'm sick all the time. So she tested it. And when she called me in, she said, I was totally shocked that you have this disease. And I said, well, what is it? And she said, I don't know. I said, well, you're my doctor, for God's sake. She said, seriously, we touch on it, but unless you specialize in those things, most physicians don't really have a lot of information, so I'll send you to a specialist. So I got in to see him. He did an MRI. He did everything. He was amazing. Um, and I said, so what's, what are we going to do? And he said, well, I don't really know. And I said, well, you're the specialist. He said, I know, but this disease is still so new that unless you're really involved in it, we really don't know that much about it. And he said, depending on your levels and your numbers and everything, everybody's so vastly different with this disease that all we can do is look at you as an individual on an individual basis and deal with them from there. So I tend to get sick a lot. I can't take the flu shot because I had Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, so I'm at real risk for all those things. Now I go on antibiotics as soon as I get anything, but I don't like to take them. And I don't know, so I don't know when to take them, when not to take them. I'm afraid to take them a lot, and I'm afraid not to take them in case I get damage. And as far as getting the family tested, the other physicians in my medical office have said to my sister, well, you don't present with anything. Just because your sister has it doesn't mean you have it, and we're not testing you. My mom was tested, and they said she was negative. My dad was tested, and he was negative. But obviously, I got... I got my SZ from them, so the doctors are not telling them anything, and I just find it extremely frustrating that I have this, and I feel, I mean, I'm glad that we're all here, because I feel like I can't get information from anybody. I can't get anyone to say anything that will satisfy me as far as how do I take care of myself. I've said to my doctor, you know, I eat a really, really good diet, I'm still fat. I exercise. I'm still fat. My blood tests are all excellent. I don't have cholesterol problems. I don't, you know, but I'm still fat and I'm still sick. So I get really frustrated that I'm maybe sicker than anybody wants and nobody wants to help me. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Am yep. I rambling? No. Nope. Uh, yeah, but no. <laughs> um, I, I, I think you're right. I, I think some... Um, People may want to help you that they don't know how to. And it follows from the question this lady had here. W you know, what's in it for me if I'm an MZ? We don't know. What's in it for you if you're an SZ? We don't know. But it would be very interesting to get together a lot of people who had SZ or MZ or any of the other minor uh, um, combinations uh, in a room and talk about what their health was like because we don't know, but we should be asking people. But as Peter said, we need a big population to find half a dozen of you that we could get together and say, the common thing is we all feel sick all the time. You know, well, that would be very useful. So when there's a focus group, we'll call you. <laughs> when and get another five together. <laughs> I, I think the other problem you get is you were tested, which means probably some of your family members just got an alpha one level done and it was normal, quote unquote. But until you get the genotype, if you have to ask for it, and the damn lab won't do it until the alpha-1 is abnormal. And so you got to call a million people. And of course, if you don't know how this lab works, you're not going to get it. You'd be better to send it off to Florida. Yeah. And you'd get the answer. 
I think tomorrow. They, if your GP doesn't have an alpha kit, uh, talk to Ben later, uh, and I'm sure he, <laughs> I'm sure he can get you an alpha kit to send away for your family members. I, I'm committing you, Ben. Sorry. <laughs> the, the other problem is some of these times your family members don't want to know either, and so they might be telling the doctor, "Don't test me any further. I'm, I'm good. That's all I need to know." And that's the problem we get into in families. Uh, sometimes you hate your sister and you hope she's got it and you don't want to tell her. <laughs> 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 your family doctor after the refuses to test you for whatever reason, how much does it cost to personally and will the lab do anything for yourself? You can't get a lab to do anything without a doctor saying do it. So go to the States, get it done. It's simple. The States is very consumer friendly. We put roadblocks to every test in this country. I can't order a, a blood test on you without somebody saying, no, why is he doing that, right? Yeah. There, there are actually um, a couple of ways that if you want to call the 800 number at Alpha One Canada, there's a couple of ways we can get you tested. 